Well, I was uh, taking a uh, London subway to the second day of a retreat, a Zen retreat, and uh, I took the wrong train by mistake and wound up at a place where I'd never been before. Uh, and I uh, got out of the subway train and stood on the platform waiting for the next train. And at that point I had lost all of my uh, intentions of being on time and had uh, never been in the station before and so it was a very unfamiliar setting to me. So I glanced off idly beyond the grimy station into the distance where there was uh, a little blue sky and some clouds and raised my uh, gaze up there and all of a sudden uh, I uh, dropped into uh, a state which can best be characterized as a taste of Kensho or an awakening experience. The essential ingredients of which was a complete dropping out of my sense of psychic self and a complete loss of any residues of deep fear or anxiety that I had ever had. Uh, so complete loss of fear and uh, a complete loss of any sense of ongoing time such that the past dropped out and all of my memories of the past and there was no concern or interest in the future. There was just this particular ongoing moment. And that can best be described as a sort of a deep sense of uh, eternity as though there was no time at all around. And the scene was impregnated with a sense of um, perfection. Although nothing about the color of it had changed and nothing about the uh, distinctness of the patterning had changed, but a sense of perfection uh, infuse the whole scene. And that was sort of the essence of the first part or the insightful part of the uh, experience. Just uh, no self and things out there in the whole world as they really are without my being in there possessing them in any intrusive sense. And um, this lasted for an unknown number of minutes and went into a diminuendo, which is a little more complex. But um, the residues of that awakening experience were with me and in my thoughts for the next two or three days. And um, I guess my uh, attitudes about that kind of experience were certainly reinforced and led to my wondering as a neurologist what on earth would have been possible in the human brain to account for all of the things that I had undergone. Uh, I didn't feel this was a visit from some deity. Uh, as a neurologist, uh, I felt it was something going on in, in a human brain and um, maybe somebody ought to try to figure out what this was and how it related to my Zen meditative practice. Well, I would certainly agree uh, that there's nothing that is permanent or ever-present. 
And I would certainly agree that there is an omni-self representation in the brain, which means that uh, our sense of self is uh, sort of present at multiple levels and on both sides of the brain. Uh, but I would not agree that the sense of self has no representation in the brain. In fact, I'll be uh, presenting tomorrow afternoon evidence to the contrary, that there are in fact regions in the brain that are uh, designed for and devoted to establishing a sense of our physical sense of self. And these, it happens, are largely on the upper portion of the brain, in the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe in particular. And having said that this is where the body sense of self is concentrated, I would also hold that there are representations of our psyche, of our psychic sense of self, in the interior midline portions of the brain, in the inner prefrontal region in particular, and also back farther back along the midline on both sides of the parietal lobe, with just a little bit over here in the angular gyrus on the outside. And the challenge for us as neurologists is to explain how, under ordinary circumstances, these self-referential parts of the brain, particularly the midline ones that I've just mentioned, the challenge is to understand how these parts of the brain can be uh, dissolved or diminished at the same time that our attention, our attentive parts of the brain turn on and become more enhanced. And that happens normally, slowly, by itself, without our doing anything, uh, maybe about uh, three times a minute. The areas that are the self-referential areas that I've spoken about uh, become diminished, let's say, at the same time that the attention areas are turned on. And 30 seconds or 20 seconds later, the areas where attention was activated turn off, and the areas where the self is represented mostly turn on, so that you have this seesaw reciprocal relationship going on by itself. You're not doing this. Your brain is doing this. That's going on automatically. And if you concentrate on uh, autobiographical tasks or other information, those areas referenced by the self turn on. And also, uh, they some of the areas back here turn on when you try to navigate your way through a London subway or uh, a Tokyo map or any geographical location where you are familiar with the local representation in space of those detailed geographies. So the question is then, how is it possible for the brain to turn on all of these areas relative to the self at the same time that it diminishes all the areas related to attention and vice versa? How is that possible? Uh, as a neurologist and as someone who has experienced various uh, alternate states of consciousness, uh, I believe that some of the answer to that question begins in the thalamus, a deep structure on both sides of the midline of the brain. And if you ask how is it possible for the thalamus to do all this, I would say that the important part of the equation 
is a very thin inhibitory cap that surrounds the thalamus and gates its activities and the way it activates the cortex. And that cap is composed of a lot of inhibitory cells. Inhibitory cells that release a neurotransmitter called GABA, gamma amido butyric acid. So that this nucleus, the reticular nucleus, can modulate all of the activity that goes from the thalamus up to the cortex and from the cortex down to the thalamus. And that's where all of, almost all of our sensory information and limbic information has to pass before it goes up to the cortex, it has to go through the thalamus. So we need to know more about the intimate details of the thalamus before we start thinking about the uh, sovereignty of uh, our cortex. We need to know about, more about the subcortex to know more about these uh, states that are non-dual. Because in the thalamus and in the reticular nucleus of the thalamus lie some of the clues to what non-duality is. One of the things that Buddhism in particular, and Zen especially, has been concerned with is uh, the disadvantageous aspects of the limbic system, the disadvantages of having too much emotion. The idea is not that emotion is bad, the idea is that too much emotion without much sense of uh, harmony to it. Uh, causes too much of our suffering. So I would rephrase your question in this way. I would say, what is it uh, about the thalamus and the reticular nucleus uh, that normally enable us to calm down excessively destructive, toxic emotions? and still leave compassion, empathy, and the other positive, adaptive emotions free so that they can be of help to us in society. How do we cut out the personal suffering and still allow other emotional uh, attributes to come through? Things that uh, D.T. Suzuki called our native virtues. How do we allow these native virtues to come out but dampen the disadvantageous emotions? Well, it happens that there are three nuclei in the thalamus, in the front part of the thalamus, that are called the limbic nuclei of the thalamus. And our emotional life goes up through these three nuclei on their way to the cortex in just those areas that I spoke about earlier as being part of the psychic sense of self. And the reticular nucleus has the ability to dampen these overactive, reactive emotional impulses simply by nudging their oscillations a little bit out of phase so that they no longer completely activate the cortex. And that can act as a subcortical way to dampen an overactive emotional life full of anxieties and fears and suffering. So that's how I would answer your question. These are normal parts of the brain. This is the way we're wired. This is the way our networks are layered as checks and balances. Uh, yes, these are evolutionary hangovers. And, 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 and they're overactive, okay? 
We're not saying, we're not saying that they shouldn't be active. Because otherwise, how will you know where your car is parked in a big parking lot? You've sort of borrowed that space, okay? So that's helpful. And we're not saying abandon fear, because that's what helps you cross a busy street with traffic on it and get over to the other curb without getting hit. We're not saying abandon those. We're saying that if you've got too much of your amygdala in your life and it's overacting, you're causing yourself too much suffering. So let go of some of that. Let go of it. And the remedy, of course, for the last 2,500 years or more has been meditation. Well, it takes a very long time to change the genome, but cultural evolution, which is what's been going on only, let's say, for the last 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 years, cultural evolution has only been going on for a very short period of time. But the question you're asking, I hope, is have our genes changed in the last 2,500 years? I doubt it, but there has been a selective advantage for cultures as a whole who recognize the virtue of, let's say, <clears throat> the Buddhist way or the Christian way or the true essence of the religious message, which is toward compassion for one's fellows. That has survival value. And to the degree that that cultural evolution has had survival value, I think, by and large, you may be having uh, a minute change in the genome of a significant number of people. So my hope is not so much on the genetic change, because that's going to take millions and millions of years. But my hope is that cultural evolution, as, and you're part of that movement, you're at the leading edge of that movement, my, my hope is that this kind of cultural evolution will have, make big changes. And in my own lifetime, I've seen big changes in the United States and elsewhere in the world. In the, in the virtues of the spiritual path, however you define it. Well, let me speak just for neuroscience, <clears throat> but uh, since I would say the uh, 60s, the 1960s, <clears throat> which means about the last half century, uh, people who follow the spiritual path uh, have been increasingly interested in knowing what are the physiological and anatomical and psychophysiological and psychodynamic uh, aspects of this ancient path. What does it mean in terms of our brain? How is our brain changing when we meditate? How does it change during alternate states of consciousness? Uh, where I'm coming from doesn't have uh, any allegiance to psychedelics. Uh, I'm coming from a place that believes in meditation, not medication. And, and I feel that people whom I meet and speak to are delighted to know that there are representations in the brain for their self. And they're heartened to know that some of the areas related to an overactive self can be dampened or diminished 
by uh, meditation, that their amygdala can be turned down because they know the word amygdala now, like they used to know the word cholesterol. And they know that too much of an, of an amygdala or too much cholesterol are bad in a sense. So just at the level of uh, language, we're starting to be more comfortable with that most remarkable of all our organs, the human brain. That's why I'm optimistic. <laughs>There are ways to meditate that take you in to an executive role and demand that you look down in a certain place and focus on it and demand that you think in a certain manner or engage in certain visualizations. <clears throat> And yet all of these involve thoughts, uh, deliberate intentions, uh, in some cases doctrines, which is a bunch of frontal lobe activity and it's very self-referential. You are doing all this stuff. And that's good as a way to begin meditation because when we begin meditation, we sit down and look down and try to count, follow our breath and so forth. So that's useful to begin with. But I'm more interested the longer I've been meditating in what we call not concentrative meditation, which is a very top-down procedure. I've been interested more in receptive meditation, which is an opening up and an inclusive embrace of the environment. Not so much focusing down at a spot, let's say, on the carpet or the wall. And that opening up to the world outside, to the other world, It gets you out into other people, other relationships, gives them a higher priority, and is a kind, is an approach to meditation which I feel is more other referential and not so much self-oriented. So if I had any mantra, which I don't, uh, it would be out there more than down here or in here. I would be for a greater awareness of the world outside my skin, the natural world, the world of nature, the outdoor world, not all this preoccupation with the self. We get enough of that anyway with our Blackberries and our computer keys and so forth. So that's what I mean by selfless meditation. It means taking in everything out there and letting go of all of this investment that we've got close to our body. In fact, I'm sorry to say um, there have been rather few functional MRI studies uh, that make a deliberate attempt to define what egocentric concentrative meditation is vis-a-vis -vis in contrast to those periods in later on in each meditative session when very well-trained meditators let go of all this task stuff and just try to expand consciousness 
at a distance. There have been very, very few in which that has been done and at the same time the investigators have asked the question, what does this person actually have in their mental uh, space at that moment? Do they have a lot of mind-wandering thoughts? Are monkey mind thoughts continually carrying on a dialogue in there or is their mental field silent? Now, anytime I sit down, and anytime most meditators sit down, we've got a lot of monkey mind thoughts going on, or there are thoughts about what to do and so forth. Thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Thoughts are a lot of left hemispheric language stuff that's intruding into what should be a clear mental field. Clarity, no thoughts. And a phrase very embedded in Zen culture for centuries has been uh, no thoughts. Not very many people are studying no thought meditation. That period in a well-established meditator's moment when they are wide awake very much aware of their total surroundings, but have no thoughts. I'm hoping there'll be more of that, because that, I think, is where a lot of Zen is coming from. I think, that, well, there's, there's several, and the misunderstandings have been going on since Zen began really in Chinese Chan, back in the Tang Dynasty in China. And let's count the, a few of the misunderstandings. One is that um, the only way that you can practice Chan meditation is by a slow incremental uh, accumulation of understanding. And often that becomes equated with uh, academic understanding or a scholastic un understanding, the kind that you would learn in, um, in, a, in some religious institution, <clears throat> the kind that might be called uh, the, slow, the slow way, the incremental way. And that was pretty much the view in the northern school of Zen in northern China, where it was called Chan, the slow course. And down in the south of China, there was another school that said, no, enlightenment is like what the Buddha had, sudden, spontaneous. And here I think we need to mention that under the Bodhi tree, 2,500 years ago, there is the notion in Zen circles, at least, that that morning in the pre-dawn hours, as the Buddha was meditating, he glanced up and was captured by the sight of the morning star, glanced up, star at a distance, the planet Venus. And that, by some accounts, would be the trigger for his enlightenment. But then, over the centuries, it became clear as my Zen master made it clear to me in Kyoto that both schools of Zen are valid. And if you're especially fortunate, you'll be able to blend these and merge these so that because they're complementary, both the sudden school and the gradual school of enlightenment will help you on the Zen path. 
That was a big misunderstanding, and it still persists to some degree. Uh, I'd say that, and particularly in the Western culture, this misunderstanding persists among those who think that they can study Zen just like any other textbook or like any other course, Zen 101 in college, let's say, if you can just take this course and cram all of that information in with your intelligence, you'll have the answer. That's not what's, where Zen is coming from. Zen is coming from our intuitive, our involuntary, our spontaneous, insightful approach to learning about the world and how the world operates. So these are old misunderstandings, but they still prevail. Uh, Zen can be practiced by those who think that it can only be attained through a boot camp approach, rigorous, strict, ultra-conservative Rinzai Zen. That's one misunderstanding, if it's overdone and practiced exclusively. And then there are those who have a more laid back approach to Zen. And that can be, can shift you in the direction of being too lax in your meditative habits. So somewhere in the middle ground, in what the Buddha used to say is the middle way, between the two extremes, what the Greeks used to say, the golden mean, somewhere in the middle ground between these two polar views is probably the best way to practice the path. That's what I believe. That's only a few of the misunderstandings. The most important way <clears throat> that it's helped me uh, is to open up the kinds of questions that we've discussed earlier, which is, what is it about meditation that uh, enables one to have salutary effects on one's behavior and one's relationships? Question number one. Question number two, what is it about uh, episodes of absorption or episodes of Kensho or Satori? What's going on in the brain? <clears throat> and I've been fortunate in the sense that right about the time that I was asking these questions, neuroscience blossomed and we started to be able to look inside the black box. And we had techniques of neuroimaging like functional MRI and structural MRI and more highly refined electroencephalographic EEG techniques uh, and evoked potential techniques so that um, it became possible for me then to reframe the questions that were coming up in my practice and to look at these different neuroimaging techniques and to start to get some answers. So uh, to give you a concrete example, uh, PET scanning came along, positron enhanced tomography came along in the 80s <clears throat> when I was on a sabbatical in uh, northern Japan. And while I was meditating and thoughts were dropping out and I was following the breathing in and out down in my abdomen, I was lying in a PET scanner for about two or three hours, which is a long time because that's what PET scans take or took in those days. And on that occasion, it was clear to me that um, much of the language areas of the brain that might have been bringing up thoughts were 
had very little activity going on on the left side of my brain, but there was a lot of activity going on in the right side of my brain. I was more right-brained, if you will, when I had been meditating for a long period of time. And the other interesting thing is that a lot of the activity on the right was more on the southern processing pathways that go through the temporal lobe. And perhaps most interesting of all in relation to the self and where is the self represented in the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex, which usually is one of the hot spots in a normal non-meditating or even a meditating brain, that this area where I've been mentioning to you that much of the psychic sense of self, the executive self, is located, those activities were diminished. There was also a difference in the activity in the thalamus between the right and the left sides. So here then are some observations or evidence which one can use to frame questions about how the brain is operating. What's going on? And those observations have been very helpful to me in trying to understand what the Zen way is and how it might result in uh, sudden awakenings. Yes, and, and is doing it. And not only can give us that information, it is giving us that information. <clears throat> um, still and all, that is not going to be, it's not going to be as useful when we're trying to determine what's important about a self-concept. If we say that the self is equally represented throughout the brain, which some do, uh, that's not going to help us define certain procedures like meditation or mindfulness-based stress reduction or certain other psychiatric techniques because we won't know what we're measuring we won't know where to look if the self is regarded as being everywhere in the brain. What I'm trying to get across is that the self is concentrated in certain particular parts of the brain and that we want to look at these parts of the brain and in particular we want to look at how they change when attention is turned on and off. Because Training attention is the essence of meditative training. And if we really want to turn off the self, the, one of the best ways that's built right into our networking and our shifting at deep levels, one of the best ways is to train our attention, our top-down attention and our bottom-up attention. This is standard meditation, Zen style. It's been going on for centuries. Top-down attention is the style of attentiveness which is governed both by a part back here called the intraparietal sulcus on both sides and is governed by an area here in the frontal lobe called the frontal eye field. And these two loci in the normal brain are what we activate when we decide to look down, say, uh, at a single point on the carpet, or when we want to look down carefully at the keyboard and see which number we're pressing with our finger to be sure. So this 
top-down attentiveness uh, is crucial throughout life because when we talk about attention, we're talking about the point on your pencil which enables the rest of your pencil, including the rest of the lead that's in the pencil, to actually be down there at that spot and trace out a letter. So attention is the critical vanguard pointing spot that focuses all of the rest of your processing. So when you train attention, you're really enabling the whole of your brain to come down to a specific point to accomplish something. That's top-down attention. And it's equally represented on the right side and the left side. Bottom-up attention is harder to define and describe. Bottom-up attention is largely governed by those parts of your brain on the right side that you devote to language over on the left side. And that bottom-up attention in the temporal parietal junction here and in the inferior frontal gyrus here enables you to become aware of the environment on both sides of your body out there. Not down here. Out there. You can take it in on both sides. Because the, the right <clears throat> preponderance and the right organization of your attentiveness in that group of nerve cells pays attention to both sides of the environment, not just one side. And that is a much more reflexive, attentive function. I would put it to you something like this. Um, in the last maybe 70 years, people have been comfortable with the word cholesterol because it relates to something vital like food and egg yolks and all that, okay. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of people are now becoming aware of the word amygdala. And they even know that the frontal lobe is in the front of the brain. <laughs> and before long, some of this basic vocabulary will start permeating into everybody's consciousness. It's not just something you would take in a psychology course. And there'll be sort of a basic understanding of neuronal psychophysiology. And people will be able to understand meditation better and themselves better by knowing this. Some people are comfortable with the term contemplative neuroscience as a Zen trained person I'm not comfortable with the notion that this really embraces the whole of the field because uh, in Zen one doesn't do a lot of contemplation one tries to let go of a lot of the thoughtful, contemplative, and just experience. Just become aware. Without a lot of thoughts hanging in there and disturbing things. Some people uh, decades ago introduced the term neuroplasticity, which gives them a feeling of comfort. Um, <clears throat> in my generation, we spoke of this as learning, 
we, we didn't need two words, we just called it learning. And we assumed it was going on inside the black box. <clears throat> and, uh, but, but I, I enjoy the, the term networks because it speaks to the complexity of the process. The other word I'm, I'm very much in favor of is implicit learning because it speaks for a, an osmosis almost of learning, which means that you're soaking up vast amounts of information without specifically trying to do it. It means you're absorbing all kinds of subtle subconscious impulses and percepts and organizing them intelligently at a subconscious level thanks to your automatic pilot without your frontal lobes in there informing you that now I must be learning something because I'm doing this. That's not the way it happens. It happens without our being aware of it. Long-term Zen is training the, the uh, intuitive, compassionate brain and we're talking about a level of networking when we're talking about genuine compassion that is at the instinctual level, deep in and around the hypothalamus, not a place that we've spoken about before. We're talking about what Suzuki called uh, the native virtues the networking that enables a newborn infant to know instinctively what to do when it approaches the mother's breast. That baby didn't need to take any college courses. That's hardwired. That's hardwired in, in a mammalian baby's nervous system. And networking that deep is involved in true compassion, which is an outflowing, an outgoing, reaching out and helping others. And to civilization, it's very important to have that kind of knowledge hardwired into your brain. It's got to be there in the brain someplace, okay? But the only way it can come out is for the fearful brain, the limbic brain, that is agonizing over all kinds of self-centered things to get out of the picture. Only then can your instinctual instincts to help other people in a compassionate way come out. But that's the goal.